Pastor and author Rob Bell shares a story about an art display that his uh, church put on once. Uh, members of the congregation created all of the works of art and displayed them throughout the church building. And one member had created a collage with quotes from Mohandas Gandhi. Another member, one of the viewers, in going around and viewing, had left a note on the piece that read, Reality check, Gandhi's in hell. Bell wonders, really? We can confirm this? So after reading this story today, I'm wondering, how can that person be so sure that Gandhi's in hell? Well, it says it right here, right? Black and white. No one comes to the Father but through me. Seems pretty clear. Only Christians, people who believe in Jesus, get to be with God, right? That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? Of course, if you look again, if you read the words that are written on the page, it doesn't say any of that, does it? There's nothing about hell, nothing about Christianity, nothing about going to heaven to be with God. So why do we read it that way? I'm fascinated by that question. Why do we read it this way? Why was Bell's community member so convinced that Gandhi is in hell? Is that how you learned to read this verse? I see a couple heads nodding. Where did you learn it? Was it, who told you that? Was it a pastor, a parent, Sunday school teacher? See, I wonder because I grew up understanding this verse in the same way, but I could not recall for the life of me where I ever heard that. Right? I don't remember a single person ever telling me that that's what that meant. I just picked it up somewhere like a case of COVID. <laughs> and that really makes me wonder how and why that message came to be in my head or in any of our heads. What I do know is that this is the way a lot of that this is the way that people everywhere think about a lot of things, right? If I'm right, then you're wrong. If this is good, then that must be bad. We humans are naturally somewhat xenophobic. We naturally fear what is foreign and different because foreign and different could mean dangerous. What is familiar, we know to be safe. It might even be some sort of survival mechanism hardwired into our brains by millions of years of evolution. So here's what I'm wondering. What if the way of thinking and understanding the world is what influences how we read this biblical text? What if we are translating the Bible in light of the world? What if our understanding of God is really based more on our own preconceived notions about God than it is about what the Bible says about God? So. If that's the case, that's actually the opposite of what Jesus says in this story. It says that the way that we know to think about God is not the way to God, that he is the way. Now that word way in Greek can mean a way like a path or a road or a highway. And I wonder if that's maybe how we are used to reading this, right? That Jesus is the path from A to B, to get from here to God. But that word can also mean a way of being or a way of life. If we understand it in those terms, how might that change how we hear this verse? What if instead of being the only path that gives us access to God, Jesus is saying that his way of life is the only way of life that allows us to know who God really is. Let's take a look at that first story from Acts, that sort of maybe oddly misplaced story in the Easter season where we hear about somebody dying. There are two ways of life evident in this story, the way of the council and the way of Stephen. Stephen is one of the first deacons, and he was so intelligent and eloquent, the story tells us, 
that the folks from the synagogue with whom he was debating couldn't win an argument with him honestly. And so they lied about him. They told the Jerusalem council he was threatening their traditions and their temple in order to get him in trouble. And when he goes before the council, he gives this impassioned sermon about Jesus, and their response is anger and violence, like we read about today. The story even says they cover their ears because they do not want to hear what he has to say. And then they stone him to death. Stephen's last words as he dies are, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And I noticed that the religious authorities in this story felt their way of life was in danger from Stephen and responded with violence. But when Stephen's actual life is in danger, is that how he responds? No, of course not. His response is compassion. Not anger, not violence, compassion for the people who are killing him. His last thought is not for himself, but for the welfare of his enemies. He's genuinely concerned about them. And to me, that testifies to a man who's experienced abundant life. The council seem like they're dying already, desperate to hang on to whatever shreds of survival they can, even if it means killing a person, but Stephen, even as he dies, is more worried about them than he is about himself. How ironic is it that in trying to save themselves, they show how dead they already are? These are the religious authorities. These are supposed to be the people who are closest to God. And I have to wonder, what is their religion doing for them? It seems to me like it might be killing them rather than saving them. And I have to wonder how often the same might be true of us. Could it be because their true religion, the way that they live, doesn't worship God at all, but something else? Something that they call by God's name? For how many religious people is this still true? For how many of us might this be true? I wonder... If, we might, if it might be that we can't understand these words of Jesus because of that. Gandhi, of all people, was once quoted as saying, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. They are so unlike your Christ. I have to wonder, what God have we found to worship and how did we get ourselves here? Stephen's story, in addition to being a story of faithfulness, shows us something else. Remember Stephen's last words? That sounded all familiar to you from anywhere? Yeah. Mind you, somebody else who said the same thing as he was dying, right? Of course it does. That's not an accident. When we look at this story, when we look at Stephen, we see Jesus. Just like Stephen saw Jesus in his vision right before he died. We see Jesus there because Stephen is following the way. The way that is Jesus himself. We see Stephen and we see Jesus. And as we look at Jesus, we see God. And so I'm wondering if we've got this all backward. I wonder if we take our ideas about who we believe, we already believe God is and import them into this story. And then we read this story and we ask it to reassure us that we're correct. That's the only way I can see how to get from what Jesus says to some claim about the preeminence of Christianity among world religions. But that's backwards. It's not asking Jesus to show us the Father. It's asking our idea of God to tell us who Jesus is, even though we've just been reading about him. If we do that with this story, with this story, what other stories might we be doing that with? And I wonder if maybe that's what Jesus is driving at here. Maybe that's why he begins this section by saying, trust God and trust me. 
Remember that this is after he's eaten his last supper with his disciples. This is right before he gets arrested. He's trying to remind his disciples and us the truth of who God really is and that it doesn't depend on our ideas or beliefs or doctrines, but on who God shows themselves to be and that God shows himself in Jesus. Remember what's about to happen to this story. I wonder if he's telling them, no matter what you see tomorrow, trust God and trust me that we know what we're doing. If you're looking for the real point of this story, I'd suggest looking past verse 6 to verse 9. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is who he is because, as he says, the Father is in him and he is in the Father. He says the Father abides in him and works in him. Abide is the English translation of St. John's favorite word. A word that he uses to describe the mystical way in which the word of God becomes flesh and abides among us. And in which that word still abides among us even today. If we read Jesus' words about the path as a description of the only way for us to get to God, we've got the story backwards because before he says that, Jesus says that he goes to prepare for us abiding places, right? Using that same word, places for God to dwell, to dwell with us and for us to dwell with God. This is a story about how God is already with us. Remember who's telling the story, right? God is already here, already among us, dwelling, enduring, remaining, abiding. When the people in St. John's story miss this, that's when they respond with anger and fear and violence. And so I have to wonder if in this story, a story which, which takes place the night of Jesus' arrest and before his execution, Jesus is reminding his disciples that no matter what happens tomorrow, no matter how much it looks like he is failing or like people are rejecting God, God still abides. No matter how much it looks like things are going to hell, God is actually saving the world. Another way to translate that Greek word way, apart from a road or a way of being, is the state of being on a journey. Like when you say, I'm on the way to the grocery store. And so I have to wonder if maybe that's the way Jesus is talking about. What if the way is not the path to God, but how to recognize God alongside us in our journey, where God already is? What if he's trying to open our eyes to God abiding with us on the, on the way? If so, I have to wonder if salvation, this word with which we are so concerned as Christians, if salvation is the destination we so often treat it as, for example, going to heaven when we die, or if it's something else. What if it's a process, a journey? Maybe God is less concerned with where we end up than how we get there. Maybe real salvation is that no matter where we're headed, by whatever path, God abides in us and we abide in God. What could that mean for us? For us individually, but also us as a community, as a church. What's the point of our worship and our religion if we're not trying to get somewhere or achieve something? What does this have to tell us as we just keep putting one foot in front of the other? What might it mean for our congregations, our denominations, our ideas of how we do church if our goal is not to get to where God is calling us, but instead to look to see how God is with us now and where God is bringing us next. Might there be ways of faithfully following Christ that don't involve worship and hymns and liturgy 
and big buildings with bigger mortgages. As we embark on this journey, what luggage are we invited to take with us? And what baggage are we invited to leave behind? The answers to those questions, frankly, are above my pay grade. But they're answers, I think, for which we are called to seek. But I wonder, though, which is more important? The answering or the seeking? <laughs>